So compost tea. Since we already kind of touched on this a little bit, I'm going to move through this pretty quick. When I make compost tea, I've got a very specific recipe that I try to follow every time. This recipe started out as one that I got from a, a guy who is local. He has a company called Garden Tea Company. He's out in Leicester somewhere. He's the one that sold me my first batch of ingredients and sold me my first little air pump. I got the recipe from him. Now, I probably shouldn't have, but I did immediately, in my arrogance, start tweaking it. And um, I landed on this recipe only because I'm you know, lucky to work here and have access to a microscope and can actually check to see the quality of my compost tea. We have people here that know how to do that. So in this little bag right here, I've got two cups of good compost, two cups of worm castings, two tablespoons kelp meal, two tablespoons alfalfa, one tablespoon fish meal, one tablespoon of C90, one tablespoon of azomite. That goes into the little bag, okay? And then uh, I'll have water that's about 75 degrees give or take, uh, you probably don't want to go much hotter than 80. Try to keep it between like maybe 65 and 80. And I'll add one tablespoon of liquid fish and two tablespoons of molasses right there. And then I'll immediately start bubbling it. Um, one thing about this system right here is that you want to be, um, just, just speaking from experience, you want to be pushing air through this before you drop it in the water. Uh, the only reason you do that is because there's all these little holes right here. I don't want compost tea going back into here. Um, just as a safeguard for that, I did not glue these fittings, so I can actually break this thing apart, clean it, run peroxide through there, or whatever I got to do. You don't want a, a lot of microbes in there that you didn't put there on purpose. Think of it that way. So now that we've uh, bubbled that for about 24 hours, we've got tea that's ready. What we have is, is not necessarily a nutrient-rich liquid, but very microbially rich. Um, we've taken the, the microbes that are in that compost and we've ballooned them out, possibly a thousandfold, just by feeding them the right stuff, the molasses, the sugars, and then all those other complex ingredients like kelp meal, alfalfa meal, those are just microbial foods. The tea is really good for soaking char. It's um, possibly better for spraying directly on your plants. I do that uh, quite a bit. In the summertime, I try to maintain a every two, uh, realistically three week schedule where I spray my orchard and my vegetable garden um, in the evening when the sun is low with the compost tea that I make. I try to ask um, Meredith to look at it for me um, just to make sure that I'm spraying the right stuff. But it's been pretty consistent with this recipe maintaining those temperatures, um, done pretty good with it. So now I've got this stuff right here that I can mix in. It's nice and soggy wet that I can mix it in with dry biochar. Um, hold on to whatever's left in here, pretty good stuff. So let me show you something that I try to do every time I make compost tea, is I'll go ahead and mix up the ingredients for the batch that I'm gonna make two weeks from now. That's all the dry ingredients that I mentioned on that list. So what I'll do now in order to try to, to increase the fungal profile in my compost tea. What I'm gonna do is I'll feed it a little bit of extra fungal food. In this case, it's just oats. This is pretty common. I'll sprinkle some oats in there. And then I'm gonna take today's compost tea and I'm just gonna sprinkle it in there and get it nice and moist. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put it in my bag that I plan on steeping later, okay? And by doing that, I'll take that bag and then I'll go store it in like, I keep it in the germination chamber. I don't run the germination chamber, but it's a nice, dark, moderately temp you know, moderate temperature environment. Really inducive. It's pretty moist in there, inducive to growing out uh, fungus. So um, let's go ahead and do that while we got some. I don't know how that's going to act. It's all got biochar in it now. <laughs> so Probably want to try to get that a little wetter. Remember that squeeze test I was telling you about? That's the consistency I'm going to aim for with this. Just for the sake of time, we'll pick this up later. Dan, how long did you let the um, fancy earth fort microbes soak in the compost before you brewed them? 36 hours. <laughs> probably not long enough. I don't know. I think it probably is what they say. They didn't say anything. There's pretty limited instructions there. I think the person from App State that taught, Brooke, that taught me about it, 
I think she said 36, maybe 48, but I think it was probably 36. I may have messed it up. <laughs> it's definitely something to look at again. Yeah. Yeah. What Pat's referring to is the experiment that I told you about with the compost tea where we took one that was just my normal recipe and then the other one where we added the, the I like to call them designer microbes. Um, and uh, had, um, I mean, not, not worse results by any means, but just not immediately noticeable results. Um, that stuff's here in the cooler if anybody's curious about it. It's a two-part system from Earthfort. Humates and microbes. Humates and microbes. So you soak the compost with the humates, um, and then you put the microbes in there and let them sit, and they're supposed to multiply and ensure you have good microbes. And so far, no results. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Let's we'll keep trying. Yeah, more science is needed. I will say that for compost tea, I, I do, um, uh, for the record, I have amazing results in my garden. Incredible results uh, all throughout the year. It does great for um, disease resistance on your plants. To some degree, it'll keep the bugs off too. Um, at least make your plants more resilient to blow, um, bugs. My kale just like perks up overnight. It's been good stuff for me. Uh, here's a picture of the compost tea from today, from about four hours ago. Just a little glimpse. Anybody know what they're looking at? I couldn't tell you what I'm looking at, except these little guys are moving around at about 90 miles an hour. You can't tell because it's not a movie. But, um, and that these larger guys right here are, are, are doing a nice little wiggle. Um, uh, an example, it, w what I'm trying to show you here is the, uh, the different levels of life. These larger guys are going to be eating the little guys. That's the soil food web in action. Worms may be eating these guys. Worms are going to be eating all these guys. Again, that diversity is what you're looking for. A little bit about urine. Inevitably, when you talk about biochar, there's somebody that wants to talk about peeing on it. So I thought we'd just go ahead and address that right now. I don't have a lot of direct experience with this, but I will say that urine is incredibly nutrient rich. Nitrogen, obviously, and then uh, potassium kind of sneaks up on you. You wouldn't think so, but it's in there. There is a guideline for, for making urine safe, and that's to store it at 68 degrees for 30 days. That's based on prior studies that indicate that, that what's probably happening here is the pH changes and the any kind of um, uh, pathogens that were originally in the urine through like a urinary tract infection, those kind of things, are, aren't going to survive as the pH changes. Direct application on soil, I'm sure you guys have had dogs and little spots in the yard. Don't put it on straight. Going to burn it. Dilute one to five for around trees, one to ten if you're going to put it directly in your vegetable garden. I wouldn't eat right away. I'd maybe give it a couple of, like a week or something to kind of do its thing. For charging biochar, now there's some really specific numbers if you want to get into it. For charging raw biochar, this is in the manual that we're going to spend the last 15 minutes talking about. You want to use two liters of urine per one liter of slow pyrolysis biochar. Anybody that's making biochar at home, we included, make slow pyrolysis biochar. It's incredibly inert. There's not a whole lot of carbon in there that's not um, the fixed carbon. That's more liquid than the biochar will hold. So what you want to do there is it's kind of meter in your urine and um, let it evaporate out. Now, what I'm describing is a compost and toilet. It's a bucket where you just pee on it occasionally until it's completely saturated, right? What you're going to end up with is, is in, and in this manual, um, he'll describe that process as biochar that has a 100 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio and urine that has a 1 to 1 by mixing um, two parts urine to one part um, biochar you end up with a, a 33 to 1 ratio 25 to 35 is your ideal composting ratio you're going to end up with something that will actually just compost just by sitting there um, that was something I learned recently. I have always assumed that you have to take P-char and then further compost it. But as long as you have some sort of uh, microbial inoculant, you can, you can compost it on the spot, which is hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, what most people are talking about when they soak biochar or with P is taking that out to the compost pile and treating it just like any other uh, carbon ingredient in the compost pile. Is beer good? Beer? Um, to put in compost to make compost tea. It's probably got a lot of sugar in it, I guess. Yeah. 
I mean, it may help, yeah. It's, it would be an expensive way to add sugar, for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, the alcohol is gonna be antimicrobial, but there's not that much in beer. Yeah, yeah. We're all aware of pharmaceuticals in your urine. You know, if you're on those kind of pharmaceuticals, I would advise not to do this method. Another thing is salt accumulation. There's a lot of salts in your urine. Be careful uh, to accumulate those. There are some hard numbers on that too. These guys, Walden effect, I didn't do enough research to really know where they're coming from, but I think it's just two homesteaders um, somewhere in the Midwest that are that been doing at home biochar for 10 or 15 years. They suggest to go to 1,700 parts per million TDS. That's with the total dissolved solids. Either solids or salts. I hear that used interchangeably a lot. Salts. Okay. And then you get it down to that number. You, you, you know, salts accumulate in the soil over time. They don't really get eaten by microbes like other things do. They kind of have to wash out of the soil. Do you have anything to add to that, Pat? I know we've had oh, some salt yeah. issues. They do wash out in our climate, especially like last month. Yeah. 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 So we have way less of a problem if you're, if you're doing this in, in the West during the summer and stuff, you could get more, more problems with it. But it's not likely to be much of a problem here. And I'll give to you and people can contact you. I, there's a link to this place called Rich Earth Institute that's doing lots of good research and has lots of information confirms the stuff about 68 degrees just know that people are going to scare you because they're going to talk about potential contamination if you're collecting this in the kind of toilets that collect yes you can contaminate the urine with fecal matter that's a whole other ball game we're talking urine that has not been contaminated if it's contaminated then the safety issues are way different you know it's urine that has not been contaminated Good point. i'm just going to go ahead and, and protect ourselves and, and put in this line that says, we're not really recommending that you do this. <laughs> do your own research, make that decision on your own. I'm not telling you to do it, um, but it does work. <laughs> and the Rich Earth Institute will tell you to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, somebody else will tell you. But they pay for their lawyers, I'm sure. Who's done Bokashi? Effective microbes? Okay, this is something I, I wanted to save some time to talk about this because I do it at home I don't do it as regularly as, as I might lead you guys to believe, but Bokashi is a, a pretty unique system um, that it starts, I'll, I'll tell you all day not to use proprietary microbes, but um, I, I've had pretty good luck with this stuff. EM1, effective, micro, effective microbes, I think. Yep. Um, effective microorganisms, there you go, trademark. Um, you can take this bottle, and you can balloon that out. I forget the math, but, but you can take this and by adding the right amount of original inoculant, molasses, warm water, let it sit for a couple of weeks, you can take this stuff and you can actually grow it out. And uh, they only tell you to do it once, but I know that you can do it a couple more times than that. So just this one gallon that costs about, I think, 80 bucks or something. It's not cheap. Um, you can take it and probably grow out 200 gallons or whatever. Don't quote me on that, but a, a lot. Um, so complicated uh, process here. Uh, not complicated, multi-step process. I've got EM that I know is done. I'll, I'll send you some links if you want, if you want to try this at home. Um, and I've taken spent brewer grain. Uh, it doesn't have to be this. A lot of people use wheat bran or something. And, and you take that uh, either dried grains, dried wheat bran, and then you um, soak it in effective microbes, and then um, you, can, you can further dry it after that. Don't heat it up to dry it, but just let it kind of like gently dry, and uh, it'll store for, for quite, uh, quite a long time. So this stuff right here is that dried brewer grain that I soaked in EM uh, a little over a year ago now. Uh, notice it's in a closed bag, absent of oxygen. Notice my airlock here. This is actually uh, anaerobic and facultative microbes. There, there's no aerobes in here, okay? This is a unique kind of system, all traditional compost, and you're talking about. Make sure air gets to it. Don't have any, you know, damp, wet spots. In this case, we're gonna try to exclude all air, okay? So what I've got at home, and I, I should have brought it in. If I'd known there was gonna be this many people, I would have brought it in. Um, but I didn't want to put it in my car. <laughs> um, what I've got at home is a food grade bucket that's propped up. Do y'all see the ball valve down there in the bottom? It's probably too dark, but I've got a, just a regular old plumbing valve that I can do a quarter turn and it opens. Okay, above that, I've got a um, bucket 
with a false bottom on it. I put that false bottom in there. All that is is another bucket that I just cut a couple inches off the bottom and just drilled a bunch of holes in it and then wedged it down there real tight, okay? So here's my valve. And in my bucket, I'll um, load in a bunch of wet, sloppy, nasty food scraps. Meat, fat, dairy, any of it can go in there. The only thing I would suggest um, leaving out is that really salty food um, for the same reasons as urine. You just don't want to accumulate salts in your soil. Um, and then take a little bit of this stuff, sprinkle it on top. What you're doing is just um, you're inoculating that food with EM. And um, say I'll come back, um, you know, maybe I've got more food. I try to maybe just do about two inches at a time of wet sloppy food, add more two inches wet sloppy food, sprinkle some more um, uh, bokashi is what they call it, sprinkle some more bokashi on it. And then what I've found is um, I just got lucky and I've got a little plastic plate um, that just fits snug inside a bucket. And I'll take that plastic plate and I'll just, when I'm done, I'll reach in there and I'll just squeeze down and try to squeeze out any air that's in there. And by doing that I may um, squeeze some um, leche down here through the, the screen. Um, close it up and then walk away. And then, uh, you know, I I'll usually can fill a bucket. I mean, if I really want to, I can fill a bucket in just like less than a week's time. Um, I don't usually do that, but I can. Let it sit for at least two weeks, um, maybe every other day, every three days. What you got to do is you got to come here and you got to drain off the liquid from underneath here. So what I do is I've got it propped up on that little crate just so I can put a little jar. My little jar fits nicely in there. It does about a jar every two to four days. That is the lechate from the Bakashi system. So um, yeah, nasty food waste that's been pickled and then been completely overcome by these facultative microbes. You can make your own EM one too. Absolutely, yeah. You want to elaborate? Use rice, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, rice and milk. And milk. Yeah. Yeah, now EM1 has quite a bit more in it besides lactobacillus. But, but the, certainly the main driver of this system is lactobacillus. You can keep making it from the more than one time, but it'll keep shifting. That's why they say one time. If you want the, you know, to be certain of the almost the very similar, very, very similar um, pro micro profile, they say to make it once. Every time you make it again, the indigenous microbes are moving in, and that's so it's no longer the EM. Just to be fair to EM, that's that's why they say that. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Could you just throw sauerkraut in there that we, you've made yourself? I mean, in that lactobacillus. It is, but it's just that. So the EM has lots of they have they have um, photosynthesizing algae and all kinds of other. You know, it's a, a big mix. You know. Remember, I told you that biochars are, are normally alkaline. Like uh, in our t LUD system, we register as high as nine. Likely that's due just to the high ash content. If we don't quench it in time, then, then we get a little extra ash in there. Um, what's neat about this is that the pH coming off of that is, is it's actually pretty incredibly acidic. I, I, I wish I had checked because I don't really remember, but I think it's somewhere around three and a half. Um, so that makes a nice high acidic um, liquid nutrient-rich, microbial-rich, acidic liquid that you can use to um, inoculate biochar. Um, anybody want to smell it? No. <laughs> yeah? Come on up. <laughs> it's full to the brim, so I don't want to pass it around. But you can, you can explain that smell to everybody. Vinegar. <laughs> it actually smells like apple cider. Yeah. Kind of like olives. Olives, Nate. Caper smell. Yeah. <laughs> Capers. Yeah, nice. Okay. Wow, that's a good nose. Um, what goes in is what comes out. You know, you put nutritious food in there, you're going to get nutrients out. They might not look the same, but they're going to be, uh, they'll be in there. I think it smells a little bit, I call it trash juice. I'm not the only one that calls it that. 
because it smells like apple cider and a little bit like the bottom of a garbage can um, to me. They say that you can do it inside. EM, EM proponents, advocates are going are to say this is a great system for doing inside a small apartment or something like that. In a lot of ways, it is. It's a nice system um, for that. If you nail it, and maybe I'm just not nailing it, then it doesn't smell at all. But when I open up that bucket, it's, it's not an acrid, putrid smell, but it's a very distinct smell, and, and my family hates it. What if you have a, a large a restaurant, a large restaurant, and make mass? Could you use a bigger bucket Absolutely. and a bigger Absolutely. everything? And then, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I like this system for a lot of reasons. I get the lechate for biochar. Um, I also get to deal with like the meats and the fats and the dairy, the stuff that, that you can't, you know, they just tell you over and over again, don't put that in an aerobic compost pile. You know, unless you're a pro, just don't even touch it. Don't put that in your backyard pit. Um, I, I like it, yeah, for that reason, you can get rid of a lot of stuff. Now, here's the trick is that um, I've got this bucket full of stuff. That's my empty bucket on the left. See my little holes? See, that's the bottom of another bucket that I wedged in there. That's my other bucket that I've just got sitting next to it with my um, Bokashi inoculated brand. Um, oh, let me show you something. Here's a pro tip. You see this lid? Get one of those. That's called an easy off lid. I swear we could do a whole class just on five gallon buckets. And we might do that. We'll keep an, keep an eye out. The Easy Off lid, that comes from Northern Tool. That's where I got that, and I bought maybe five of them. They're like not even, a, maybe a dollar a piece, maybe a little more, I don't know. Real nice if you're doing something like opening a bucket all the time, like I am. Here it is, uh, it's, sorry for the blurry pictures, but that's my food that I threw in there and sprinkled some Bokashi on. I'll add more food, I'll pile that up till it's about maybe three quarters full. That's my plate my little plastic plate that I just wedge on there, push it down. That's what it looks like after it's been sitting for a couple of weeks. Definitely got some serious fungal action going on, whatever that is. Now, what do you do with that? That's not compost. You know, that's not topsoil. You can't mix that in straight. What they tell you to do is um, uh, go out and dig a hole. Either put it in your regular compost pile at this point, or um, go out and dig a hole in your garden. I dug a hole in a new bed that I'm trying to establish um, about a month ago. And last night, I went out there and dug it up. And I can tell you that it's almost entirely gone. Almost. Um, there's a little piece, I think there's garlic scapes or something in there that are still persistent. Um, I had a, a little paper bag of banana peels, and I threw that in there. The paper did not, it, it's still there. The paper still looks like it was, you know, originally. Just kind of interesting. Could you put that in the worm bin or would that be toxic to the worms? Probably gonna be a little way too acidic for the worms. I think they would be pretty upset. You know, maybe you could dose it to them, but I would, certainly wouldn't load them down with it. Um, I'll tell you one thing I did too, and this just probably has a reason to do with why I still see persistent bits in the soil. I just took that bucket and just dumped it in and then covered it up. Absolutely next time I'll take it and kind of stir it up, make sure I get lots of nice topsoil around it. Um, but I have no doubt that, you know, a month from now, that's going to be a, a nice place to, to, to put a tree. This is uh, the lechate under the microscope. Now, this actually looks, this is uh, Meredith looking at the lechate from the last batch, probably like back in April. And it looks a lot like the original EM. The only thing I can tell you is these little green bits, we believe those are the photosynthesizing bacteria. Photosynthesizing bacteria, lactic acid, that's the lactobacillus, yeast. Actinomycetes fermenting fungi. So there is fungi in there. Don't ask me what any of those do, but again, I'm looking for diversity. The important thing they do is outcompete the pathogens. Yeah. Make it more likely to be safe. Though I would, I would say that you would treat Bokashi and, and the leachate from it as if it were raw manure still, because it's not guaranteed to you know, eliminate all pathogens. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, that's for the elderly, the very young, and the immune compromised. For the average person, probably not a big deal. But you know, if you're talking safety, you wouldn't, you wouldn't count on it as you know, being absolutely, you know, not like a worm's gut or hitting 132 degrees for the right amount of time with the compost. It guarantees to take out 
all the pathogens. Yeah. yeah. This is definitely mean and there's very few. Very, very few. Yeah, we're getting down to some pretty low pH there. Okay, who's doing compost at home? Just like the regular old traditional compost pile. You guys hitting temperature? Like getting it nice and hot, keeping it hot for a little bit? Okay, good. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, I struggle with that. Unless I've got a mountain of grass clippings, I, I definitely struggle with getting it hot. Mixing as compost, what I mean there, instead of mixing it with compost, is the idea that you can mix it as an ingredient in your compost, is um, probably ultimately the best way to do it, I should say. It's, it's going to be the most reliable. Um, it's that time element uh, that's going to make sure that um, the microbes that are in your specific microclimate are going to be well suited for what you need. Um, this manual here, I, what I've done is printed out one page for you guys. It's, I think it's 14 pages. Happy to share a link with you or just give you this when we're done. It's called Composting with Biochar. The guy's name is James Joyce. He's an Australian biochar guru. This thing was written, I think, probably 10 years ago. Been doing it for a long time. Black is Green, that's the name of his company. It's written right on the top. <laughs> um, uh, I found this to be incredibly helpful explaining the, um, um, the nuance of compost and uh, biochar as an ingredient. What basically he says is treat uh, biochar as, a, um, as another carbon. In this case, call it a black carbon instead of a brown carbon. Um, and uh, the same deal where you want to get your target carbon to nitrogen ratio at about, you know, let's shoot for 30 to 1 carbons. Remember I said earlier you can take one part char and two parts urine. Um, if you do the math here, um, it comes out to, I think, 33 there. CN ratio of ingredient A, 100. How many parts? Let's do, we're going to do one. 100 times one plus CN ratio of ingredient B, urine, one, times uh, two. So take that number, 101, 100 plus one, and divide it by the total numbers of parts, which is three, and you get about 33. So that's within our... Um, target carbon to nitrogen ratio. Everybody tracking on that? So you can do that um, with as many ingredients as you have. So you've got a mountain of grass clippings, like I do, um, and uh, a little bit of char and some leaves. I can guess at this. A lot of ways it's a guess and check game. Um, carbon Nitrogen ratio A. Um, let's say I want to put in one part uh, biochar again. So we're going to go 100 times 1. And then I think, uh, I don't know, let's put in two, two parts leaves, okay? Plus 55 times 2. And then um, let's do... Um, 10 parts grass clippings and just see what happens. So 15 times 10. 100 plus 1, or 100 times 1, so that's 100 plus 55 times 2, 110 plus 150. Um, 210, 260, 360. Divided by one plus two, three plus 10, divided by 13. Who can do that math? 36, okay, great. Nice work, okay. So that's pretty close to our target range. Um, what we might try to do is add, uh, I don't know what happens if we add two parts um, grass clippings to that. So that's 15 times 12 now, that's 180. Um, this is 390 divided by 13. 
whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, whatever that is, it's a little bit closer to our target carbon to nitrogen ratio. A big reason why we want to add um, biochar to a compost pile, um, a, a couple of reasons. Again, it's like ensures, if you, if you can nail a compost pile and get it right, then it ensures that your compost is gonna be really well inoculated. Um, it helps you to get your compost pile right. Um, creates these, especially the large pieces, are gonna create little passageways for gases to escape or to move across the pile. Um, it's gonna allow air to come in. Um, it, it's also going to, remember that picture of char under the electron microscope and how porous it is. What it's gonna do is actually trap gases too. It's gonna absorb ammonia gases, certain greenhouse gases that would otherwise uh, escape off of your pile. You can also put it down at the bottom of your pile to catch any excess liquid um, coming off the pile or pass through biochar on the right out. You can pre-charge the biochar with compost tea like I just did and then take that uh, biochar and then put it in your compost pile. And what you've done is just like seed your compost pile with the microbes that you know you want and you can presumably jumpstart the composting operation instead of letting just wild microbes come in there and do it. You can jumpstart the process. You can also do it as that, that process to further reduce pathogens, where if you do something like urine char and you want to load your char up with urine uh, and get those nutrients, then you can further compost it and guarantee that it's going to be safe. Um, same with the Bokashi. Now what I did last fall when I did my big compost pile, had a bunch of raw biochar, actually had two bins of Bokashi that were ready to go, so I had 10 gallons of that slop, put it in there, um, had a little bit, all kinds of funky stuff. Um, had a wood chip pile that had been sitting and um, uh, rotting for, for two, three years. Um, added that stuff to it, just added all kinds of crazy diversity. Ended up with some decent compost um, um, and ended up with some fantastic biochar, certainly out of that pile. So my compost at home, I put yogurt and some milk products. Is there a way, should I restart or should I just make the, the shop, or, I'm sorry, the Bokashi? Bokashi with that compost that I have or would it be okay just to keep on continuing, just not put yogurt and dairy in it? I'm gonna say what I think and then I'm gonna let Pat, who can probably more eloquently answer the question. I think that you're okay if, if it gets crazy hot. You're gonna be fine if it gets hot. Okay. It's hard to guarantee that it's gonna get hot though. It's gotta get hot, hot. Like over 140, I think. So, I mean, I'm just building it day by day. Yeah, I would stop doing that. Okay. Yeah. I use all the things they say not to use except for fat and salt. Yeah. And, I but I have made compost, if you make compost well, the real, from what I could tell, that's a, a, a dictum that just gets repeated, repeated, everybody looks it up, they pass it from the next one. Yeah. It's, I don't think there's any scientific basis on it, it's all microbe food. If you get it to process to further reduce pathogens, right, to 132. And it's like yogurt, I mean, what are the odds that it's gonna have a bad pathogen in it? It certainly is torn up by the microbes, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I just think it's, it's out there in the, in the internet, and it was in books before that, and everybody just says it at one person. And that's why you say it, is because everybody says it. It's a safeguard, because a lot of people think they're composting and, and maybe necessarily aren't. Um, so you're generally safe, I think, if you do that with your grass clippings or whatever. But um, yeah, to throw foods, and it's, it's a rodent attractant. I mean, I'm, I know that's the main reason why you're not gonna do it. It's definitely going to bring around way more pest if you have those higher value foods in there. Yeah. And I think that's why Rodale and those people originally said it is because okay. you're less likely to bring, you know, but don't fool yourself. You can still get rats with nothing but vegetable waste. Right. Okay. I'll cover this real briefly because I know it's getting late. Here's an interesting theory about using biochar from this guy from the uh, Ithaca Institute. This is definitely something to check out. If you guys just want to geek out on biochar for a while, check out the Ithaca Institute. And um, this paper was maybe published again 10 years ago. Um, just kind of riffing on the idea of um, how it, maybe it's a little wasteful to make biochar and then immediately put it in your soil. Um, when biochar itself is such a fantastic filter medium, it has a lot of other oddball properties. It actually shields electromagnetic waves. It's insulating material. You can take a, um, biochar and you can mix up a plaster 
And then you can um, use that presumably to actually filter indoor air. It's a nice black, has a nice matte finish. Um, again, it'll shield the electromagnetic waves. Um, it's an insulating material. I've heard of somebody who takes that plaster and puts it on like 16 inches thick, um, uses it as an insulation. And then when you're done, if you're gonna tear your house down or whatever, just chip that plaster out and then put it in your compost pile or your, or your soil. Use it for, for an, a higher value and then use it in your soil. Um, a lot of people that now, there's a lot of research right now about using biochar in storm, uh, storm water runoff management systems, in uh, coal mine drainage systems. They're taking biochar and they're absorbing uh, pollutants in the biochar. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure how that's going to work to, to further put it in the soil. I don't think they're doing that. But, um, but just be aware that biochar has quite a, a few other applications. I'll circle back around and talk about what I want to do in the pond now that I've had this experience with the aquaponics system is, is again, I'm going to clean up the pond with the biochar. By filtering the pond, we're simultaneously inoculating the biochar. You know, just try to get moving on that um, if, if you have a use for it. Um, uh, filtering the air of hen houses, the people have been doing that for a long time. Um, using charcoal as uh, bedding for animals, people have been doing that for a long time. It's, uh, it'll absorb the urine and um, help manage smells in a, in a hen house for sure. Um, little review and then we're done. Biochar is helpful to cr uh, crush it, screen it. Applied raw, biochar will suck in the nutrients out of your soil, no doubt. Condition biochar by adding nutrients, add microbes. Biochar should be wetted as part of the conditioning process or prior to. Now, uh, some people just run uh, rainwater through it, you know, just to wet it and, and move off uh, any residual ash or anything in there. Laid out a couple of oddball systems for composting at home. You guys just like pick the one that's right for you. If I was gonna start doing anything tomorrow, I would do the worms, it's so easy. Um, just me. You gotta have high organic matter in your soil regardless. If you go through all this effort to feed your biochar and make this like cranking really nice biochar that you load into dead soil, um, eventually those microbes are gonna run out of food and you're gonna be done. You, you still gotta feed your soil. Um, and this is, I, I'm still a bit of a newbie at gardening myself. I've only had my garden for three or four years now. But what I find is that I've got, I know that I've got this incredibly like powerful topsoil now. Um, I know that because I put mulch on it and that mulch disappears. Um, so I'm feeding my soil mostly with my mulch, the occasional spray of compost tea. Um, I do probably one application of compost a year and um, I'll put a little bit of worm castings in at each new planting. Um, like at a transplant, I'll just put a little, little bit in there. Um, other than that, I don't really have a, a fertilizing um, program by any means. If you're gonna condition your char, again, mix it with a high organic nitrogen source like your worm castings or your good compost. And best practice is to keep it moderately moist. Don't let it dry out. Keep it moderately warm. Don't let it get too hot or too cold. And uh, let it breathe. These little bags, the little um, tea bags over here, um, are a nice little container for that if you have a very small amount. Uh, perforated bags are okay, perforated plastic bags. If you go buy a, a bag of black cow compost, it's gonna have little perf holes in it. And it's for that reason. The plastic woven bags will breathe. Plastic poly woven bags, yeah, those, that's, that's what I was looking for. Consider the cascading applications that I described and put it in at one to 10% by volume. It's obviously a lot easier in practice to uh, put it in by volume instead of trying to, to weigh it. That would be pretty hard for a non-scientist to do. Get it in the root zone if you can. If you have just a small amount of biochar that you make throughout the year, best thing to do, get it right there in the root zone. A good way to do that is to mix it with your worm castings. A little bit of compost if you have it. Do the compost tea if you want. Do the urine if you want. Um, but get it so that you know it's nice and inoculated. Um, 
you, another step you can do is, is buy some um, mycorrhizae inoculant powder. At that time, you can add it to your conditioned biochar and then uh, put it out with your transplants. Um, that would be the recommended method for putting out small amounts of biochar in a garden. That powder you put on the peas, is that what you're talking about, that powder? Uh, it's different. Yeah, it, this is a mycorrhizae um, inoculant powder. And um, how many of you guys have worked with that? Okay. Yeah, um, fantastic stuff. Pat, I'm going to let you explain mycorrhizae. Okay, so mycorrhizae are just fungi that have a direct relationship with plants. A lot like, um, you know, a lot of the fungi we love to harvest, you know, fungus, mushrooms we love to harvest are actually mycorrhizae. And there's two kinds. There's ones that grow on the outside of the roots, and they are specific to just some tree species, but the greatest number are the ones that grow into the roots, and most of our vegetables have that relationship. Brassicas, our broccoli family, and beet family don't have that relationship, but most of our vegetables, our grasses, our flowers, have that relationship. And basically those fungi are working like fine root hairs. They spread out, they, they make lots more water available, they outcompete other pathogens, um, and they actually exude acids that make recalcitrant minerals like phosphorus available. So it's, it's very effective. And actually, when Dan was talking about feeding the soil, small gardens, he hasn't got the focus yet on cover crops, though I'm leaning on him about it. Um, cover crops are the very best way to feed, feed the soil because they're pumping food out to feed that microbial community. And then as those roots are dropping off, the glues from the mycorrhizae, the right mycorrhizae produced glues, are actually grabbing some of that carbon and making it much more stable so it stays in the soil. So it's very powerful. But I would say if you're trying to make sure that you have a, a, a way to keep the mycorrhizae alive longer, then it's, it's fine to put it in the char and that people do that. But if you want to be sure that it's active as fast as possible, get it on the roots. Yeah, that's why I said put it when you're ready to put it out. Right, put it add it to the plant, roots. Yeah. One thing you don't want to do is compost it. You know, you'll kill it if you, uh, if you put it in before you compost. But what you're getting is the spores of the mycorrhizae and they need roots to become active. So once they touch the root, that's when they germinate and they become active. And it's probably being made active by those exudates. I, know, I don't know for sure. Yeah, in my defense, I am doing cover crops now. All right, I just, yeah, sorry, just not talking about <laughs> it. Yeah, just can't talk about it. <laughs> and it's a lot harder if you have a small garden because you have to, you know, you always want to grow stuff in it and you don't think you have time for cover crops. But that's another talk. So when you have your biochar in your garden, is it okay to water the plants, like not the whole plant, but the roots with the compost tea to keep it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, do a, a, like a soil drench with compost tea. I'll tell you what I do, um, and I don't remember where I got this idea from, but um, maybe pr probably from that, uh, it's a speaker that we had come here, um, Michael Phillips. Mm -hmm. What he does, he does a compost tea. He is a fantastic writer. I did get a copy of his book about four years ago. Holistic Orchard, yeah. What he suggests doing is mulching your trees with wood chips, and then, um, uh, drenching the, the like a fresh pile of uh, mulch with uh, compost tea. Okay, my dad, he does tree work and he's always having um, wood chips. Love those wood chips. Yeah. yeah. There's videos online on our channel. Okay. Yeah. yeah, does he get into that, his spray schedule and the, holis yeah. the holistic sprays? Yeah. Doesn't he mostly use EM because he doesn't think he can make good compost tea? Uh, maybe, he, he did say that in the book, although he talks a little bit about compost tea, I think. Yeah, he says compost tea is great. It's just that it's harder to dial in. The thing about buying the microbes is they're dialed in. Yeah. You know, so if you don't know that you have good compost. And something I wanted to mention when Dan was talking about all this is you can't tell everything you want to know about compost by doing it, but you can tell if you've got really bad compost, you definitely shouldn't use by doing a bioassay. And that's simply growing something like cress or beans that are going to be very um, susceptible to bad compost, to the wrong acids and alcohols. And then you just count like 10 or 100, you know, so you can do the math easily and you see how well they germinate and how well they grow. And if they all die, then you know your compost is crap and you don't want to make tea from it. <laughs> if they do well, then you know that your compost is good. It doesn't mean there isn't any pathogens in it, but it means that it hasn't, made, it hasn't got a whole lot of bad acids or alcohols that are going to make the plants die. And that's, that matters. You know. We're done with the presentation. <laughs> um, 
Thanks for sitting through that. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks guys.